So, good evening. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the cinema of the DFF, the German Film Institute and Film Museum. I'm extremely happy that so many of you came for tonight's lecture in film, uh, the inventor of the form, the cinema of Chantal Ackermann. I'm extremely happy that we have Alisa Lebo here tonight with us, who will be introduced by Professor Vincent Schrediger in a moment. Um, I would just like to welcome you all and explain very quickly most of you already know the procedure here. We're going to have the lecture, then a very short pause, and then the screening of the film. Tonight we're going to see news from home. And I would like to um, say quickly that we are going to screen the English version of the film tonight. And for those who are interested in seeing the French version of the film, we're also going to screen it this Saturday at 6 p.m. here in the cinema. So um, you'll get to see both versions if you're interested in also comparing that. Both versions uh, are without uh, subtitles so also the French version on Saturday is going to be without subtitles just um, for that information. Um, all the program of the lecture and film as you all know is in our leaflet and in our website and I would like to um, already announce uh, our next events because there's a lot of uh, lecture and film events coming up. Uh, in uh, June, our June program of the cinema here of the Film Museum also just came up, came out, so you can grab a copy here outside um, during the pause or after the event. Um, and we're going to have uh, three lectures in June. We're also going to have Eric de Kuiper, who was here last November. He's going to be coming back with his uh, newest film and with a um, Q&A afterwards. And we're also going to have uh, one of the main um, programs or the theme programs in June is going to be dedicated to Delphine Sehik, who we have seen here very often in Chantal Ackermann's films, uh, just now in Letters Home that we screened yesterday um, and on Sunday, for those of you who came to see the accompanying film. Um, and of course, in Jean Dilman, uh, which we're going to screen in June as part of the lectures. But we thought, well, since we're going to screen this film, we might as well do a whole series on Delphine Sehi. So I warmly invite you all to check out the program. Like I said, it just came out. And um, yeah, already put in your calendar all the um, events in June. Now to tonight's lecture, I would like to invite Professor Vinton Schrediger um, on stage to talk about tonight's guest. Thank you very much. Yes, hello and good evening from my part. Uh, it's good to see that so many of you were not deterred by the good weather outside uh, and still made it here. I mean, uh, from here on out, I'm just going to advertise the work of um, our previous speakers alongside the work of our current speakers. So uh, I'm currently on a roll with advertising um, Babette Mongold's writings. Uh, she was here, as you know, at the beginning of this season. And uh, she recently published a book of her uh, writings in film theory. And <clears throat> the volume concludes with a wonderful short text called My Friend Chantal. Um, and that text contains a wonderful sentence that um, describes one of the driving forces of Chantal Ackermann's work. And the sentence is quite simply, she had a desire to know where she was coming from. Um, and that means two things. Uh, Chantal Ackermann was very keen to know more about her Jewish heritage. And she was very um, connected with her mother uh, throughout her life. And if you, which is actually quite possible, wrote a history of major filmmakers for whom the relationship to their mother was a key driving force uh, in their oeuvre. Fassbinder would certainly one of them. But Chantal Ackermann would figure in that series very, very prominently. Um, her mother appears in various guises in her films. Sometimes she acts as in uh, Les Rondes Boudana. Sometimes she is sort of referred to um, through characters in the films as in the golden 80s, uh, where the shopkeeper's uh, wife is, uh, in a way, a figure that's modeled on, um, on uh, Ackermann's mother. And her very last, and, and then she wrote a, a novel, which is actually uh, Une Famille à Bruxelles, which is actually a long prose text spoken or written from the perspective of a figure that closely resembles her mother and in a way turns around 
uh, the perspective or turns around the, the narrative to look at herself through her mother's eyes. And then uh, obviously there's um, uh, Chantal Ackermann's final film, No Home Movie, which will conclude um, the series, uh, which is another engagement uh, with her mother. Um, <clears throat> another way of describing that facet of Chantal Ackermann's work would be by picking up the title of one of our or tonight's speaker's books, uh, which is First Person Jewish. Um, Elisa Lebeau is uh, a guest in our series who continues uh, uh, a, a pattern that we have been lucky enough to establish in the series of filmmakers who are also scholars, or scholars who are also filmmakers, which include uh, obviously Eric de Kauper and uh, Babette Mongold. Um, Alice Elbo started out as a documentary filmmaker uh, in the 1990s and was then drawn towards film studies uh, as her career as a documentary filmmaker progressed. Uh, she earned her PhD in film studies from uh, NYU, New York University in 2001. And she then moved to Turkey uh, where she taught at Bilgi University from 2001 to I think 2008, right? 2003, okay. And after which she moved to England, first uh, taught at the University of uh, West England in Bristol, then at Brunel University in London, and since 2013 she has uh, been a professor at the University of Sussex. Um, she continues to be a filmmaker, a curator, and a film scholar, and she is, and that's why we're very happy to have her here tonight, uh, one of the world specialists, obviously, on the work of Chantal Ackermann. Please welcome together with me, Alice Elbo. Thank you, Vincent, for inviting me and for Laura for having me in this wonderful theater. It is slightly baffling t to me to see this many people in an audience for, uh, wow, <laughs> for, um, a, f a film series uh, of this kind, I'm very jealous. Now I'm thinking I should be living in Frankfurt if it's, if it's a city that can bring people in on a beautiful Thursday evening to see one of my favorite films, but one that doesn't always get the attention I feel that it deserves. I happen to have a very soft spot for news from home. Um, I should just say also, um, I'm jealous that you've been coming to this series, and many of you have heard talks that I haven't had the benefit of hearing. So uh, in the q and A, I I may turn questions back to you to find out what you've heard um, and thought and know. So I'm just as curious about what you know um, and have learned uh, over the last several months um, as you might, might be about me. So as I was saying, I'm very fond of this film and very excited to be able to, to introduce it. Uh, in part for very personal reasons, this is a film, one of the very few films that I've ever seen that depicts the New York I remember from my childhood. And although it's shot by an avowed outsider, I've never actually seen anyone shoot the New York of my childhood better. This is a New York that was in a downward spir spiral. Basically it was derelict, it was desperate, it was bankrupt, literally bankrupt. It was in probably the, the worst state of decline it had been since the depression of 1928 and nine. It was defunding basic services rapidly. Uh, you may have heard of the fires that were raging in the Bronx and in Brooklyn, basically in Harlem, in, in all of the poor and black neighborhoods. Many people thought this was these were insurance scams. Um, but actually, it had everything to do with the defunding of the fire departments and the closing of fire stations. Um, also, the great use of New York in a very hot uh, hot summer um, of the fire hydrants. Uh, about by the night by 1976, when Ackerman is shooting, something like 25 percent of the hydrants were not working. Um, this is a city that filed for bankruptcy months before Ackerman arrived uh, to make this film. Uh, Ford refers to President Ford at the time 
to the city, drop dead, vows he will veto any bailout for New York City. It's a city of racial tension, tremendous racial tension. It's a city of white flight. Um, many, uh, large proportion of the white middle classes were moving out by then. Uh, it's a city of something like upwards of 10% unemployment. Um, industry was, was uh, faltering. Uh, I think the year before 1970, well, actually between 70 and 75, something like 500,000 jobs were lost in New York City. But it's also a city of possibility. Uh, it wasn't very expensive to live there. It was uh, a place that had laws, for example, the loft laws, the artist in residence ca uh, campaign to get artists to live in loft lofts in Soho, in Tribeca. These are absolutely out of range by now. This is a different city. This is a different New York. It's this, the New York that I miss, believe it or not. There, was, there were things like rent control that people like Rudy Giuliani made sure to get rid of. It was inexpensive to live. There was a thriving art scene. Um, punk uh, was starting uh, in New York, um, in uh, in, a, you know, par in parallel to what was happening in London. Um, there were. It was entirely possible to dream, to imagine, to experiment, to innovate. Those things are no longer possible in New York. I think of Berlin of the 1990s, for example. Um, that was the New York that Chantal Ackerman was coming to, to make this film. It's not that we had never seen this on film before. In fact, the early scenes uh, of News From Home, of which this is taken, from which this is taken, uh, reminds me of nothing other than the prototype uh, music video of Bob Dylan that precedes the film Don't Look Back, Don Pennebaker from 1967. Those are the same Tribeca streets that Ackerman uh, was shooting in, in News From Home. So it's not that we've never seen it, but it's not the New York City that we uh, think of now. Chantal Ackerman made the film. Wait, we don't need to look at Bob Dylan for the rest of the, the time. Chantal Ackerman made the film in between two of her best known feature films. Um, the first, I, I suppose you've already seen, Jean Dillman from 1975, uh, and the second, Le Rendez-vous d'Anna from 1978. Uh, Jean Dillman, of course, is not her first feature film. Je Tu Hilel was her first feature film, but the big one that broke um, her name uh, when she was only 25 years old, of course, was Jean Dillman. But News From Home was a kind of break from this uh, newfound fame, which, as you know, came extremely early to Ackerman. It's a return to the kind of experimental filmmaking that she was doing earlier in New York. I believe some of you might have, have already seen the screenings of Hotel Monterey and La Chambre from the early 70s. In fact, I believe that News From Home uh, bears the most resemblance of all of Ackerman's films to Hotel Monterey. They both employ some, something of the same method, the long observational takes, often at what we've come to think of as a respectful distance, something that Ackerman prided herself on, but also with her signature penetrating gaze. Both Hotel Monterey and News From Home delight in the use of moving chambers, an elevator, in, uh, an elevator in Hotel Monterey, a subway car, an automobile, and a ferry in News From Home. This is uh, from, one of the, from the ultimate shot in News From Home when she's on the Staten Island ferry, receding, moving away back from Manhattan. Both of these films use these uh, erstwhile uh, moving chambers to amplify the motion of the motion picture camera. Both of them are enamored of New York, a city that Ackerman returned to over and over in her life, and where legend has it she learned about the films of avant-garde filmmakers like Jonas Mikas and Michael Snow. If Paris was to become her base for fiction filmmaking, New York was her city for experimental, non-narrative filmmaking, at least in the decade of the 1970s. Ackerman, her, Ackerman made her first trip to New York when she was only 20 years old in 1971, 
leaving Brussels abruptly and vowing to herself to let her family know only once she arrived. In her words from the time, once I got there, I told myself that I've had to, I'd have to write them a great deal in order to keep them up to date, to maintain the connection. New York, for my parents' generation, at least, is still a sort of myth, a dream. For me, what I saw every day was Soho, the subway, loneliness, and that was no match for the myth, a myth already rotting. At the same time, I was living an extraordinary experience. To see people as blurred as myself, that did me a lot of good. They seemed to be going nowhere, and I didn't know where I was going either. Back home in my family environment in Brussels, people got up at seven o'clock, they went to work, they were defined. In contrast to them, I was always drifting. On her verse, first visit, Ackerman stayed in New York for seven months, received a slew of letters from her mother, went back to Belgium briefly, and when she returned to New York three months later, she somehow knew she would make a film. She said, I was in the plane and I thought, my mother's going to send me those letters again. That's how I got the idea for the film. Though she came up with the idea for the film in 71 and lived in New York more or less continuously from October 71 to March of 73, she didn't actually shoot the footage to go with those letters until 1976. Intriguingly, Babette Mangold, who some of you have heard speak, I don't need to tell you, but I have in my notes, Ackerman cinematographer from the 1970s, tells us that News From Home was funded by German television as part of a series of portraits of cities by independent filmmakers. They got to know Chantal, she tells us, because of Jean Dillman at Cannes. News From Home was made for only $20,000, and while that is a small budget even for the time, remember they're shooting in film, and of course I just lost my place. Um, she apparently used some of the funding t that she received from German television to pay off the debts that she had incurred in the making of Jean Dillman. About the making of Letters from Home, Ackermann said, I had a sort of plan. I knew very well the places where I wanted to shoot. I knew how it would start and how it would end. It was to be, pla be paced around the subway sequences, above, below, but nothing systematic. I knew how the sound would organize itself with quiet moments, and then there were more violent ones. Everything plays in terms of ruptures, visual ry rhythms, lines. First we edited the images. During the sound editing and mixing there were terrible slumps. We had to entirely reconstruct the soundtrack. We created music, pure music, which is nevertheless inseparable from the images. As mentioned, this film is shot by Babette Mangold, a filmmaker in her own right and a close collaborator of Ackermann's. Much of what we know about the making of the film comes from a 1995 interview with Mangold, conducted in French by Janet Bergstrom and only recently published in English in the latest Camera Obscura issue that came out in 2019. We know that Ackermann returned to New York in April of 1976 to prepare and shoot the film. They shot it in the last week of June, in just one week, and it was apparently edited in Brussels, although Mangold seems to contradict herself on the matter in the interview. We learn that Ackerman lived in the Hotel Excelsior on 81st Street for at least six weeks in 1976 and wrote the script for the film there. I'm not actually sure if that means that she was going through and extracting her mother's letters and organizing how she wanted to present them, or if indeed she wrote part of these letters, that is unclear. She also apparently was taking in the city again, refamiliarizing herself with her old haunts, riding the subways, going to different neighborhoods. Mangold describes this as the period of gestation for the film and says it was midway through that period where she learned of the idea of the voiceover narration. While I'll return to the question of 
voiceover narration and sound in general in a few minutes, I want to dwell a bit now on the visual aspect of the film. News from Home has a very particular look, which is due in part to the use of a new and sensitive film stock that Mongold wanted to test out in this film. They were able to shoot in low light conditions to get an almost pastel quality. Let me skip one of the slides here. Wait, I'll go back to that. The pastel qualities though I wanna to go to. Mongolt refers to the quality of the image as chemtone, a word that I really had to look into um, to, to understand what she was referring to. Chemtone, actually, with a capital C and a capital T, was, was a chemical process developed by a particular lab that Mongolt was working in called TVC that no longer exists, and it was such a secret process that um, nobody knows exactly how that look was produced. But just to say that Mongolt was not the only one experimenting with these images. This is an image from uh, Taxi Driver, from Martin Scorsese's film of the exact same year, 1976, and they also were using the chemtone process. Uh, it, it would push the film stock for brightness without increasing contrast, apparently, um, keeping the subtle shades and nuances intact, but making the blacks a bit foggier. It's a technique used um, by many films of the time, but uh, one that was very new. I referred to the pastel quality of the images, and I think you might, uh, now, now that you've seen several of Ackermann's films, you will notice this is an image from uh, Jean Dillman, an image from uh, Tu Nuit, which is from 1982. This is much later, both used in um, No Home Movie and in the installation work Now. This is an image from No Home Movie. So the pastel tones are not something that we're unfamiliar with in uh, Ackermann's work, but starting, I suppose, with Jean Dillman and then um, developed uh, further with chemtone processing in um, News from Home. This is something that she was obviously particularly interested in. As a result, the images of New York in this film have at times a painterly quality. I know we often, film studies people use that term um, a little bit loosely, um, but really it's almost as if it's, uh, there are images in this film that are updates of David Hopper's uh, famous painting, Nighthawk. Here is from News From Home, a different angle of a diner. This is more f uh, a more common framing for Ackerman, the frontal shot, again, of, of a diner. Um, but she's working with a particular set of references, and I think that you'll, you'll probably be able to identify more, uh, indeed, as you watch the film. Certainly the fixed camera, when not placed on a moving platform, whether the subway cars or the Staten Island Ferry, the static frames operate as a kind of tableau vivant, carefully framed as life moves in and out, or as the case may be, towards and away from the camera, Marie Walsh, in her article about the film, refers to these static shots as Ackerman's camera fixe and says it is a phenomena of strange proportions, being an immobile stare, yet allowing us to move distractedly within the shot, scanning its surface details, wandering aimlessly over the shapes, colors, and objects. Note the kind of abstract qualities that are being referenced here. But as Walsh herself notes, Ackerman's camera is not always fixed, and the erratic alternations between the camera fix and the mobile camera, at one point apparently affixed to a car as it drives down 10th Avenue, is part of what makes this film so unpredictable, so surprising. Just when you think you've got its modus operandi, it does something unexpected. Walsh says, and I concur, the fascinating thing about Ackerman's camera in News From Home is that it simultaneously generates a fixed stare and a mobile diffusion across the surface of the image. The New York in this film is somehow simultaneously evacuated and heavily populated. It's bustling and still, cacophonous, and if not silent, then muted. The mother, both is and is not present, 
Thank you, Vincent, for raising the question of the mother. A lot of the writing about this film, um, like no home movie, is precisely about the relationship between the mother and daughter. So um, I will be addressing that, but not in any detail. But there's plenty um, to go, blend, plenty to go back and read if you're interested. Uh, sorry, again, lost the space. Um, the mother both is and is not present, hard to shake off, and yet never quite there. The closeness and intimacy wrought by the words, I long to hug you, is mitigated by the gnawing guilt that exudes from each letter. The distance between the words and the images is something of a relief, another kind of breathing space, from the endless pull or tug of the mother. And yet, instead of showing us how exciting her life is as a filmmaker, in contrast to her mother's often dreary letters, Ackerman reveals her alienated, distanced view of her adopted city. She has a feel for the city, to be sure, but it's always at a remove from, from the outside looking in. As Kenneth White suggests, Ackerman is not a New Yorker. News from home is the product of an individual on uneasy terms with her environment. I don't necessarily agree that she's on any more or less uneasy terms than many New Yorkers uh, were at the time. <laughs> the film is not all or only about alienation. There's actually a lot of love in this film. First and foremost, the love of the mother expressed over and over again, my darling daughter, your mother who loves you. There's also the love of New York, both above ground and underground. There's an affection for its dysfunction, for its empty lots, for its potholes, its graffitied trains and weary commuters, slightly suspicious yet resigned to being caught in her steady gaze. There's also tremendous love for the mother by the daughter, even if there is some tinge of cruelty in the act of reading out these private missives never meant for a public audience. The film has actually been interpreted, not least by Ackerman herself, as being slightly unkind to the mother, as if it's contrasting the dullness of the mother's words with the dynamic cosmopolitanism of the filmmaker daughter's adventures in the big metropolis. But as I say, actually, I don't think it really is about the cosmopolitanism of the exciting adventures in the big city. Perhaps it even reproduces the dullness in another register. After all, the image of the city Ackerman chooses to show is not the bright lights big city one might expect, but simply another version of a mundane workaday city full of average people and unexceptional streets and subway cars. The automobiles are beat up, the streets are full are the, the streets are ragged, the face is gloomy with the prospect of another day just like the one before and the one to come. It's as if Ackerman travels as far as possible only reprodu to reproduce the quotidianness she has left behind. And the mother accompanies the daughter unwittingly holding her from afar. As if in the empty vistas of New York, unable to connect deeply with anyone or anything, there is still the anchor of the mother whose simple and repetitive refrains reassure, calling her just that little bit closer, allowing her, in effect, to be in two places at once, and thus to be able to bear the strangeness in the familiar and the familiar in the strange. Sometimes the audience has to struggle to hear the mother's words. They get drowned out by the sounds of the city. You may notice that the daughter's adopted city can threaten to eat the words whole devouring their simplicity and straightforwardness with its urban wiles. Adriana Sarn notes that at times the voice is rubbed out as if it were writing. Sarn conjures the image of words erased on a page, but drowning is something else. It's a battle, a struggle. It requires an effort to be made. We don't simply stop trying to hear the words. In fact, we try that much harder and not the way we would try to decipher erased pencil marks like a spy, but rather as if we were trying to remain faithful to that which we are entitled to hear. We are not accustomed to feeling as if we are illicitly overhearing the words of narration. They're usually ours, ours for the hearing. And yet, it is perhaps for this reason that I find it so extraordinary that Ackerman takes liberties with, with that which is normally, rightfully, ours. 
She stretches our capacity, makes us aware that not all words are there to be heard, at least not at all times or with the same ease. This is done intentionally, so don't assume that she simply didn't have a handle on the soundtrack. In fact, Ackerman was always very attentive to sound in her films, and especially, I would say, in her documentaries, or what I think of as her documentaries. She tended to call them bordering on fiction. She was known to have multiple tracks of audio and otherwise work against any kind of automatic naturalism that sync sound tends to produce. Perhaps I should add that the entire soundtrack was post-dubbed in this film. Nothing you hear was recorded uh, synchronous to the image. The mother's letters, whether clearly presented or overpowered by other sounds, are a prominent part of this film. The words of the voice of the voiceover can sometimes seem out of place. The letters come in at erratic moments. There can be long gaps between them, and we find ourselves waiting for them, anticipating, misidentifying moments where we expect them to come in. And then they can surprise you when they do come. This is a film that requires patience, like most of Chantal Ackerman's films. It requires that you allow the rhythms to overtake you. You have to allow yourself the time to be, to look, to live with the tensions and contradictions of what it means to grow up, to move away, to stay connected, to be elsewhere, to be a child and an adult, to live in two places at once. And just a few words about the version you're about to see. You're about to see. Laura mentioned that we're looking at the um, English version that Chantal Ackerman recorded. She recorded two versions, one in French and one in English. For many years, those of us in English-speaking countries, con um, pardon, sorry about that. Uh, for many years, those of us in English-speaking countries were not even aware of the French version and assumed, in our arrogance, I suppose, that this was the de definitive version. Whole theories have been spun about the translation of the mother's words from the mother tongue to another's, the alienated space in between home and elsewhere that opens up in the accented speech of the daughter, voicing words of the mother that the mother herself would not understand. Articles, chapters, and whole, a whole host of assumptions have been written and made about this act of translation. And in fact, there's something textural as well as textual about this act of translation. One can sense the distance and the difference by virtue of the tongue lag, a different kind of jet lag. So imagine our surprise when I, sitting next to one of the pre preeminent scholars of Ackerman's work, learned in Basel that in fact Ackerman's own privileged text, her preferred version, is actually the one she recorded in French. Generations of film scholars and Ackerman fans in the English-speaking world have blithely assumed that the English language version was the consummate version, the one that neatly articulated the dislocation of the daughter from her mother and enacted the division of the self, the split subjectivity that spoke in a broken tongue. And we learned, many of us after publishing texts on the topic, that we were mistaken. We temporarily retracted our words. We toyed with writing errata. We certainly doubted ourselves, but only for a moment. And then we realized that we weren't necessarily wrong, nor was she. Her intentionality and her preferences only relativized the situation. They could not override it. Ackerman may have preferred her French version, and while we certainly we were certainly chastened. We were, or at least I, decided that the English language version might still be preferable. So yes, I asked to show this version. It was a revelation, I have to admit, that there even was a French language version, but of course there was. Yet the English language version, at least for me, resides where the film resides, that is to say, in New York City. It acknowledges a life lived far from the mother in a language the, mo the mother had never mastered and could not access, yet her words are brought into that world and sometimes swallowed up by it as a kind of invitation. The mother's letters insist. They insert and assert a quotidianness that says, we're here in Brussels living our uneventful lives and you must recognize us. We are with you. You must remember us. 
And while the daughter's gaze is taken up with so many others who people her frame, and with a landscape that defies as it engulfs, she nonetheless creates a space that brings the mother along into her world, translating her for us, and to some extent, us for her. So as I say, some of us learned only recently about the new version. And while you may now suddenly feel that you're not watching the director's cut, as it were, you can console yourself in knowing that some of the top Ackerman scholars disagree with her assessment and still prefer this version with the translated accented letters that allow us to register the complex maneuvers required to be in those two places at once and to negotiate divided yet deeply felt allegiances without erasing or smoothing out the difficulties. It's all there to be heard and felt and seen in the tensions between sound and image and in the accented voice that delivers the mother's deceptively simple words. I'll end with Ackerman's own assessment of the film. I think it's a voluptuous film because of the noise, because of the images, because of the colors, sensual delight. There are a lot of people who don't know anymore what that is. Thank you. I understand you do questions and answers. It feels strange to be answering for Chantal Ackerman's film, so uh, I might pass on some of these, uh, depending. Feel free to do so. Um, it, it almost feels like we've seen the film twice, because your introduction was so poetic and in the rhythm of the film, um, that, that the film, you know, seemed like a reiteration. I have a question about uh, depth of field and focus. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, the part of what is so radical about this film is the, the way the sound is mixed and the sound perspective. I mean, normally the standard aesthetic of film, particularly American film, of course, is that everything is optimized uh, for dialogue and the facial recognition. And and so you get close-ups, and you you know everything is organized, ordered around the dialogue. And here, the di the dialogue, or the monologue, or the lent, and the voice of the mother, which is the voice of the daughter, significantly, of course, is somewhere in the middle ground. And the 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 the, the, the street noises uh, always overlayer the dialogue so it sometimes becomes imperceptible and only if there is no street noise or train noises do we really hear clearly what the letters are saying um, and if you I mean if, if you look at the pictures uh, Babette Mongolt is a very technically proficient camera person and uh, it was clearly a choice to have a lens that had very relatively short focal length and not a whole lot of depth of field. So there's always, again, somewhere in the middle part of the picture where you have a very clear, sharp focus. But most of the picture is sort of in various degrees out of focus, which gives it uh, the painterly quality that you also referred to. Um, I don't know if you shared that observation or if you agree with that, but I just found it absolutely fascinating how, how, fascinating how the, the voice was sort of located somewhere in the middle of the picture, to put it this way, where the picture is in focus, but at the same time, you know, the, the, the environmental sounds would always overlay it. Well, in terms of focus, I think we had a little bit of a problem. Um, it tends to be in better focus. Mm -hmm. Um, in I mean, my this experience. was an original 16 millimeter print. Yes, yeah. but did you notice the second reel was in a better focus in terms of the full picture? But it is a short depth of field, that's for sure. Uh, and I think, I mean, for me, a lot of the painterly focus comes from the pushing of the image, which creates a graininess that, I mean, I actually worked in 16 millimeter in the 90s, in the late 90s, when Kodak and Adfa had perfected uh, very sensitive film so that they got rid of the grain and we ended up having to push three and four times the stock so that we could <laughs> we could reintroduce the grain. Yeah, the grain 
yeah and the painterly quality exactly and the tonality exactly yes. but and but it's also of course her interest in these abstract lines and shapes and and it it emerges in some frames more than others that really this could just be an abstract painting <laughs> um the, where you can sort of pick figure out what you're looking at but it's actually you you can kind of change your own depth of field right. in and out of focus yeah um, and uh, could you come back very briefly to the question of the language, the French versus English, and how you ultimately would defend this as the real version, or the, or at least one that you can yeah. uh, draw your conclusions from? Yes. Well, I mean, I think she clearly made two versions. One reason for this would be that she would prefer not to have subtitles uh, in a film that where the visuals are so important. Uh, and where the audio is so important. So you're really able to, you know, you're not reading the bottom of the frame. Um, I think I, you know, you learn this early, early on in film studies that interpretation of the film is, you know, equally important as intentionality or more so, right? The filmmaker can say whatever they want. Um, but Absolutely. we sort of, retain, exactly, we retain the right to uh, disagree and and interpret otherwise. And I've noticed, I mean... Uh, in a way, and I don't think it's—I don't think it's only because Chantal Ackerman is no longer with us. Um, I think in her lifetime as well, she tended to kind of have a very strong and clear opinion about her work, and and um, mostly people defer to that. And in in fact, I mostly defer to that as well. But I I think this this film maybe it's because I had already read Hamid Nafisi and Ivoni Margulis and Joanna Mora writing about the the accented mm. aspect of the of the voiceover. Maybe it's the arrogance of those of us working in English and and writing in English and, and living in English. Um, to say so, but I think there's reason enough to think that this version has enough resonance and complexity to the fact that she's reading, she's voicing the mother's words in a different tongue. Um, this isn't the only time that Ackerman voices her mother's words. She has a very interesting uh, and little known installation called, I think it's called uh, Autobiography slash Self Portrait. It could be called Self Portrait slash Autobiography. I don't remember from 1998, where she reads from her uh, her autobiography slash biography of, uh, of her mother. Mm. Um, and in the, and she uses images from Hotel Monterey, from I think Jean Dillman and one other film, which I'm not remembering. So the images are from her films and the voiceover is her own voice and it slips um, from the first person to the third person, mm. and one isn't ever sure whether that first person is the daughter's or the mother's yeah. perspective. Um, her, I mean, I actually wrote something called Identity Slips, and it has to do with the way in which Ackerman and her mother's voice and words uh, often can kind of slip back and forth, right. who's speaking and, and in what way and what register, and, and is it um, from the first person? Yeah. Um, or is she able to differentiate between the mother's voice and her own? And here I think the, the, the one kind of clear distinguishing factor is that she's speaking it in English. Right. From her pers perspective kind of across the ocean um, in New York. So there's something to this version I don't necessarily think it needs to be the definitive one, but I think the the reading and the interpretation of uh, this version uh, remain resonant, very resonant, Absolutely. I think, for me. I mean, what you were just describing is also something that you can observe in in the novel um, *Une Famille à Bruxelles*, where which starts out as purportedly uh, the mother speaking. And in a in a tonality that's very similar to those letters, and then it switches over, and and it becomes unclear. Exactly. And I was fascinated by you when, when you you had this short passage when you were sort of intimated that uh, Chantal Ackermann actually may have written some of those letters herself. <laughs> well, I mean, I I don't have any documentary proof uh, one way or the other, and certainly we have encountered this mother's register mm -hmm. and voice and uh, mundanity um, many times in in action and in word. 
uh, and I, I mean, if we are, I mean, we are also familiar with Ackerman's voice and her words and her rhythms, and they are different. Mm. But she's certainly able to mimic the mother, and she, as we know, sl can slip back and forth. So, I mean, in a way, your guess is as good as mine, and I don't know that it matters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whether these are all actual letters, I guarantee you she got many letters of this sort. Um, and very likely they are directly from the mother and translated um, in from the mother's words to hers, but why Ulti not? Ultimately, what remains is the film. Yeah. That's what we're looking at. Do we have questions from the audience? Yes, please. I don't have any questions as such, uh, to your relief. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, what we might call a kinship insofar as I also watched the film as a person who had been in New York City at that time. And uh, I have to say that uh, I pretty much ignored the voiceover completely. Um, I think that that will, one's experience will color one's view of a film. I often go to films that are filmed in New York so that not, not so much to watch the film, per se, but to uh, watch the locations and to see if I could recognize places that I might have been or that, I've, that I know. Like, for example, I knew right away the back of the post office building, and um, I, uh, I, I watched a couple of clips online uh, beforehand. Uh, you may be interested to know that there's a version with uh, French uh, dialogue and uh, Spanish subtitles. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, but um, and so I knew that that was a, a, a tracking shot up 10th Avenue and uh, I compared the images from the film to Google Street View to see what was there and what isn't it's very interesting to do you might want to try it um, but uh, as I say I just wanted to acknowledge that um, that uh, common experience Thank you. Um, I admitted, I ad admitted, admitted to Vincennes before the film that there, that at some point I projected the film uh, for a party without the sound, without any of the sound, and just sort of DJed to it. Uh, it's it's phenomenal the images, and um, it's almost impossible if you know New York at any point um, not to try and figure out where these things are shot. And I feel in a way fortunate, in a way distracted, that it was the New York of my childhood. My father worked n fairly near Wall Street, um, uh, which actually was quite dilapidated at the time. And, and uh, you know, I, I knew Soho and Tribeca quite well, and all the, uh, the up I don't know shots. how old you are, but I was 19 that year. And uh, I had just started going to New York City on a regular basis. I didn't grow up there, but I grew up near there. And so it was kind of a... It was kind of like a, a an Oz for me, you know, yeah. a shining city that I wanted to get to. Yeah, and, and I mean, how did you feel about me saying that she didn't shoot it as a shining city? Because in a way, I mean, that I grew up in the suburbs, and I'm a bit younger than you, but not that much. I was a young teenager, 76, 12. Um, and for me, that city, no matter how dilapidated and derelict, was the city. And I knew I would live there, and it was just, yeah, it was, it really was a magnet. Um, for well, I, I reckon, I mean, I, I was, I, I, I found the, uh, the shot of the number one train going south, very, uh, um, I identified with it because I had been on that train, and got off at Christopher Street more than once, um, and, uh, and uh, what was I going to say? I lost my train of thought. Yeah. Never mind. And come back if there's another question. Any other questions right now? Or comment or thought or um, I have a question perhaps. And um, I was thinking throughout the film about something that isn't in the film and that is um, Ackerman's letters to her mom. And the whole time um, I was thinking about what was this choice to only put her mother's letters and not put the response. I mean, we can know that she was writing the letters from what she, the mother was writing, but um, I don't know, perhaps you have any thoughts or comments about that? Because I thought it was, it's something that strikes me a lot that it's uh, not in the film in a way. Um, I mean, that would fill in all the blanks, wouldn't it? 
although her mother complains that she doesn't have enough detail and she doesn't know if she has friends and she's never certain where she's living even and all this, it would be the shot reverse shot that she refuses in the entire film. Um, I mean, yeah, it would be a completely different film, but I completely also understand why that's impossible. Or rather to say, in a way, the visuals are the response. In a, in a sense, her letters back. So which would show to her mom what her life is like in, in New a York. Bit, in a way. What she couldn't do just by writing in a letter, but showing this. Yeah. Which, of course, she doesn't do literally, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, these aren't no home movies, right? These aren't home movies. But uh, uh, in her way, it's, it's her response, I, I think. I mean, they're, as they used to be called in early cinema, they're views. And, and so in a way, they're postcards sent back uh, in, in response to, to the letters. And, um, let's talk about the mother a little bit <laughs> and about the question of guilt. Uh, there, you know, but one of the standard formulae that that the mother uses is "It's been so long since you last wrote." Or write, write more. It, you write know, more. I got three last week, but none this week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, as if the postal or, service was so consistent. You know, and 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 it was delivering them as they're sent. Right. Yeah, the most multi multi layered one for me was uh, when she tells her about how she read the letter to to her dad, and he was happy all day. Like, you could do this every day. Why don't you? It does him good. It does me good. Uh, write to your aunt. Visit your uncle. Yes. I mean, this is sort of endless, uh, l you know, litany of, uh, you know, some kind of filial, you know, bond right. that, that pulls at all, at all times. But um, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I think. I think Ackerman. Ackerman really did take this on, and I think mm. you know, in some sense, every film she made was a letter to the mother, right. um, or as Brenda Longfellow says, love letter to the mother. Mm. Um, and I go so far as to uh, wonder if she didn't end her life in some sense because the mother was no longer there to write to. Um, I think I overstep my bounds and when I write that, but I do I did write um, about that. Um, I think it's taken on as guilt. I think she's also, I mean, this is where Ackerman refers to the film as a bit cruel, mm. that she's, you know, in some sense making fun of her mother, <laughs> right. right? now, the nagging mother, you know, while I'm here, you know, mm. having this wild avant-garde life in New York. Right. Um, but at the same time, I mean, she there there is so much... Of the of the relationship or of the I don't I mean guilt is is one part of it, mm. um, but some responsibility. I knew that I would have to write, you know, all the time to keep them up. She's keep them up to date. She says yeah. in 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 her own writing. I mean, not everybody did that. I and mean, people were letter writers. You know, they weren't texting, um, and it wasn't uncommon. But I think you know she really did feel. Uh, responsible to her mother in some in some way, no matter how much distance she uh, often put between them. And this this is in so many of her of of her films in in one way or another. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, the the two of you actually spoke of your familiarity with the city and with with the locations depicted. And uh, I only ever made it to New York in 1989, when the city still looked like this in some parts, but it was already transitioning to, to something else. Uh, but this, of course, is the, 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 the New York that, my, you know, people my age know from Serpico and uh, City. Taxi Met driver, movie. mean Taxi streets. Taxi drivers, mean streets uh, from movies. Um, but, but what is interesting so so even as a you know viewer who didn't spend time in new york at the time you can try to relate to these images in this way but what's striking in relation to the to the, to the letters of course is that there is no familiarity in a strict sense in the pictures at all i mean people look at the camera um in in the subway uh, you can pick out faces of people on the street, but basically what's so radical about the film is that there is no 
anchorage in terms of familial bonds or familiarity and there's nobody you know or anybody knows yeah so in that sense it's a radical break from the guild structure or familial uh total anonymity yeah in a yeah. way absolutely and 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 she doesn't she doesn't try to break that at mm. all um except by the length of her stare yeah. which makes some people uncomfortable and other people you know, somehow figure out how to accommodate that. Um, yeah, I think that's part of how I've started to think about the film uh, is that actually she's trying to reproduce something about uh, the dullness and the mundaneity of her life in Brussels, but in this radically different mm. setting. Um, and she can only do that at this remove because she doesn't exactly. have the, the dailiness and the routineness and the family right. in New York. I mean, in that sense, the, the, the very first shot uh, seemed to be particularly interesting, the two cars, you know, the one that passes, and then the other one that tries to drive up the street, and there's a moment of hesitation, because clearly the driver sees the camera in the middle of the street, and then decides to negotiate his way past the camera. And so there's an interaction with the camera, uh, but you never see the person driving the car, even as the, as the car drives past the camera, so it's basically... You know, the car as an anonymous entity that interacts with the camera in a very strange way. You saw him? Yeah. What did he look like? <laughs> yeah, there was a driver, but, he looked, but not an he looked identifiable as if he face. Them to move. Sorry? That's how he looked. He looked expectant, as if I'm going to stare at you and you're going to move. Oh, okay. And then they don't. Um, did, did anybody notice Chantal herself? Um, in the window yeah. on the subway, only when they go into kind of the tunnels, so that so that it's dark enough outside that you can see the reflection inside between yeah. the station. Yeah, um, and it goes on for quite a long time. Interestingly, she's you know it's not she's not really a cameo type of director, but but in this film, that's she left her signature. That's the cameo. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we we have a question in the back. Sorry. YouTube this is why you have good. to come to the cinema. Exactly. You know? Good you came. But YouTube doesn't give you that. Sonia, please. Uh, thank you for the the presentation. I, I would just have a follow-up comment on the question of sound, uh, because to me it seemed that uh, as the film progress, um, the um, reading of the letter becomes more and more um, disturbed by the sound of the city. And... Uh, um, yeah, at the beginning, um, the the um, letter, the voiceover is much more clear, and there are just few points in which uh, the traffic um, noise interrupts this. Uh, the the uh, under um, yeah um, the understability of the the reading, and in the end, uh, or towards uh, the middle and the end. Uh, it becomes much more present, the sound of the traffic, and we just keep so, um, some words, but uh, the the whole phrase, the meaning of all, whole phrases is not there anymore. So uh, to me, it seemed like this kind of, um, like the, the uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, the relationship between mother and uh, daughter uh, was kind of uh, yeah, a little bit th thin, or mm -hmm. like uh, yeah, the, in a way there was a, mm, yeah, uh, like the slow cancellation of a relationship or uh, the distanciation. Yeah, the the distanciation, or maybe just uh, the the her like. Uh, uh, dwelling in, in the city and kind of um, uh, and the letter becomes just uh, noise uh, or mm, yeah I, I mean know. I think there's something to that um, but I mean very very early on her le her words are already disturbed and I think in part the something to that is that we already know what she's saying and so it's no longer Con content, right? That that anybody needs from those letters. Simply, the fact of them seems to be also important. But but she does 
come back in terms of eligibility and, and it wouldn't ever, I mean, Ackerman would never just slowly make one move, right? There's always going to be kind of lateral moves, backward, backward steps. It would never be kind of a, some direct trajectory, I feel. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't want to go too far. For example, you almost, almost only see uh, don't walk signs, right? But of course it's Ackerman. You will also see walk signs, green lights, green signals. Um, you know, she wouldn't, she wouldn't give you that sort of comfort of knowing for sure that it will always be the red don't walk sign. I mean, there will, there, there won't be a formula, um, in the structure of the piece, but I, you know, I think, I think you're right that more frequently we have the the sounds of the city in some sense drowning out the letters, but in, in another sense maybe simply kind of at the same level, <laughs> operating at the same level. We no longer need the, the content in the same way. Mm -hmm. That's my reading anyway. Can we, yeah, please go ahead. Just an observation. It was um, quite privileged to see the Frankfurter watching in fr <laughs> watching it in Frankfurt, sitting here. <laughs> That's my subway. little joke. <laughs> also, the train station looks like the Frankfurt train station, which is, <laughs> you know, stuck in the CD seventies. Well, you allow you allow me to to po point out that uh, that scene that has two partial circular pans. Um, she does a circular pan, obviously, in La Chambre. She has one circular pan in Hotel Monterey. She has one circular pan in Dest uh, of many years later, 93, I guess it's made the film. Um, and here she doesn't fulfill a circle. So it's, it's one partial pan and then another partial pan. And she's in, she happens to be shooting that in the um, 42nd Street shuttle station. So I think she's at Times Square and the, the train is going to Grand Central. It's a very oddly shaped uh, space where you're kind of crossing from, from I don't remember if it's the A train or the 1, 2, 3, across to the shuttle, which goes uh, parallel across 42nd Street from, from uh, Times Square to Grand Central. And you have this, I've always thought it was a very odd station and, and you know, you figure out how to negotiate it, but it's not straightforward at all. And I think it's fascinating that that's a place where she decides to do a circular pan, but an in two incomplete ones, where it's more like oval, um, <laughs> but but interrupted. Yeah. Um, somehow it makes sense to me for the shuttle, for that weird station. Um, but yes, the Frankfurter, that was, that was my little local joke. <laughs> It'll never work anywhere else, I think. <laughs> well... The audience appreciates hamburger. I could do the Hamburg one for you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of, of shots that you can find repeated or echoed throughout her uh, films, the final shot, mm -hmm. Staten Island Ferry, the Staten Island Ferry, uh, which has echoes in both Allmeyer's Folly, yes, but in reverse with the arrival of, of Allmeyer standing in the boat, and the final shot of La Captive where you have a very long shot of a boat and again a standing a figure standing in a boat arriving so it's sort of the reverse uh, of that shot and in in both Almire's Folly and and particularly in Lock Up Deep, the music is um, the Island of the Dead by Rachmaninoff and it's a clear reference also to to Berkeley. uh but but that, that's what I was thinking about in this shot as well. It's it's an amazing, amazing shot. I mean, the... the so it runs, you know how long it runs? It runs 400 feet, the exact length ten, of a 16-millimeter yeah. yeah. reel. Yeah, maybe 11. Yeah. Between yeah. 10 and 11. Uh, did you also screen Ameri Histoire Amérique, uh, American Stories? No. It was a uh, accompanying film. It yes. wasn't, we didn't have a lecture, but we showed uh -huh. it here in the film museum as a uh -huh. accompanying to the series. Because there's all, there's literally the Staten yes, Island, Island yeah. Ferry uh, shot in that film. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it might be arrived. No, no, she's she's also drawing also away from Manhattan. And she tells um, kind of a bib 
well, not a biblical story, but a story about religion um, and tradition over that. And of course, it, it has the, the resonances for her and for people like me of Ellis Island and the arrival. That's uh, actually what I thought, that Jews. it was the Ellis Island. Uh, it isn't the, actually. It's the Staten, it's the Staten Island. Island. She Staten really, Island. and she's yeah. also on the Staten Island ferry. And one of the two documentaries, and I'm not sure, I can, I'm not remembering which one, that came out the year of her death. Um, she's actually shot. Um, we see her in frame uh, on the ferry. It's a v- obviously very important um, geographical space right. for her. Um, so yeah, it's a re- it's a repeated shot, and it's some it's meaningful, I suppose, also that she's re- she's receding or retreating from that Absolutely. space, which is actually the space of arrival normally exactly. yeah. for the immigrant. Yeah. yeah, she does a lot of reversals too. Dest is a kind of reversal of her parents' yeah. journey from Eastern Europe to exactly. yeah. Western Europe. She goes in reverse, and here you have another kind of arrival. She's always a bit out of step, which I think is exactly what makes her so cinema. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Extraordinary. Okay. Yeah, we have one more comment here. Short question, please. I was not so lucky and couldn't follow the series here, so, but I saw just from Ackermann de Lest, uh, is it the title? Yeah, genau. Yeah. And maybe just you can, I mean, for me, this movie reminded me a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dest. Dest, yeah. genau. But maybe you could just point out very shortly, technically speaking, it's it's another theme, of course. I think so. There are, another se- there are different themes treated in the movies, but could you draw on uh, the technical aspects which which were similar or different between these movies? Maybe this would be interesting for me, you know. Yeah. When you're talking about technical aspects, you're talking about how how it's shot and and yeah, uh, excuse me. yeah, yeah, so like sh- shoots and cameras movements and you know it's a good question. I don't remember what she shot Dest on. I'm assuming it was also shot on 16 millimeter, but I could be wrong. Uh, a lot of Dest was shot. Uh, they rented a a, tr- a truck bed uh, and a driver, uh, and you know, kind of fixed the camera on a truck. And so you have these long, slow moving pans, you know, people might be trudging to the right as the, as the camera's trudging to the left. Uh, the compositions are fair, fairly similar, um, in terms of kind of that head on composition in Des, there's a, a, a good deal of interior space, uh, in, in, uh, news from home. It's, it's just, really the subway as interior space. Um, and also there are setups, there are certain types of setups. I mean, you know, the man cutting his salami, the woman listening to her record player, I mean, the, the level of setups are um, fairly frequent. The dancers. The, the, the dancers, I suppose they would have been doing it anyway. I believe that one is a uh, documentary yes, scene. And as yeah. with the the um, viol- viola concert, mm. I think that was her then partner's teacher. And uh-huh. she knew of the concert um, and filmed that. Um, the, record- the sound recording was done separately again um, and, and even more layered. In the est, much more kind of exaggerated, uh, and in some sense more subtle, I think, than in than in news from home. But but you know, in some in some ways they are, um, I don't know, they they are very closely re- related films in her oeuvre. They you know, um, maybe it's not a not a huge surprise that I wrote quite extensively on the est and that I'm drawn to this film. There's mm. There's something that they um, echo. I uh, take the opportunity to point you to our series website, which is called chantal-ackerman.de, uh, which has recordings of all the talks. And um, uh, Claire Atherton, uh, Ackerman's editor from, I think, 1982, to the very end, picked that film and talked about it and talked about the particular questions, but also of the the rhythm of editing and and how they worked on the film. So I would just point you you to that. Um, That film has a very clear structure, much clearer than than News From Home because it's it's by the season. 
So it starts, I believe, in autumn, goes into, or maybe late summer, goes into kind of winter, spring, and then uh, early summer. And, and it also geographically goes from uh, East Germany in deep into Russia. So um, that trajectory, although one can't really place where <laughs> at any given point exactly they might be, it has, you know, it has a much clearer structure seasonally and and geographically than than news from home would have yeah but maybe the, the connection really is there in terms of of her you know desire to learn where she's coming from uh, this is uh, this is clearly an exploration of of the origin of her parents and her family so we have a question up there one second please Yeah, there was one thing that really uh, stuck with me that you said in the lecture before the film. And uh, you commented on this almost contradictory way where uh, the city seems empty and crowded and full at the same time. And I really felt that, especially in those inner city and subway scenes where uh, it almost felt like an oscillation between this almost intimate closeness Uh, like in the midst of all these people and then at some point there's always this moment or for me there was always this moment of almost alienation when I realized the gaze or, and the other people maybe uh, realized the presence of the gaze um, could you elaborate on that in regards to the final scene because for me that had almost the effect of bringing the city closer even though she was departing from it especially when the sound of the machines from that uh, boat intensified the more she left. Uh, yeah, could you maybe elaborate on that, if it makes yeah, sense? I kind of want to ask you to elaborate on it. Um, the final shot is, isn't actually the one I had in mind when I was thinking either of this kind of evacuated city um, of dawn. They shot... Um, Several of the scenes are shot at dawn, so you get one car or no cars or one person on the street. And then they also shot, well, they shot all different times during the day, but clearly there are rush hour scenes with people uh, crowding the streets and cross, you know, these crossways. Everything is a, it's a crossway. Um, To the night, to the nighttime scenes, to the you know workers who are working you know night shifts when, when again the streets are emptier. So actually, I hadn't been reading, hadn't been understanding the final shot uh, as part of this kind of evacuated and crowded city. The one that, that you know this great city that never sleeps appears to sleep in her film to some extent um, but so I'm curious how you how you associate that final s shot with a kind of a, an intimacy with the city or it hadn't even occurred to me I don't think I can elaborate on that I, but I'd like to hear your thoughts for me it was more uh, that it wasn't intimate that reminded me of uh, that closeness in those city scenes Ah, it, so it kind of brought back in in it in the absence it brought back the yeah. the city to you maybe yeah maybe that is what happens in a way when one leaves a place it's as if one reviews where they've just been um, so I think that that may be the the intimacy and I think maybe an, an ingenious aspect of the final scene where um, you're leaving as well you know we're all leaving. <laughs> the city and she gives you a lot of time to reflect on where we've just been uh, but again I, i you know i cannot watch this city this film without reliving my city experience and so i'm actually very curious to hear for those of you who either don't know the city at all except through movies or because of course everybody has seen everybody has seen films of new york uh in one guise or another um but how you respond to this film because for me it brings me to a place you know I don't actually miss New York City I don't haven't lived there for 20 years and I don't miss it at all because it's already gone for me right and so when I go to this film it's like full presence it's as if it's as if she's brought back that city that I really was magnetically attracted to and love but so I'm, I'd be more interested in hearing how how others respond to the 
experience. Yeah. Lolly, yeah. No, I just wanted to comment because um, I don't know what's your name, but I really liked your comment about how this kind of like shot of drifting away from the city has like this very intimate resonance. And I think that uh, people who have been living in New York and actually have been like spending a lot of time in the inside of the city, the bubbling inside and the noisy inside, which is the subway, um, also have the same like, mm, I mean, it's part of this love affair, right? Like you've been inside the, 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 the you know, the city, but then also to kind of like master it by observing it from the outside or seeing it in its entirety, because I, I think, I mean, so for me, yeah, I mean, what you were saying was very true, that there is this, like, the very last shot where she kind of, like, drifts away in which you feel like it's it's almost her embracing um, this this very intimate partner. Um, yeah, so just wanted, I mean, you know, since the, I think that the film raises a lot of um, nostalgia, whether imagined or real, towards New York. So whether we experience it through film or we actually lived in it and can recognize some of the spaces. Um, also the feeling of, um, and, and Elisa, you also referred to it, the below and above, um, which is kind of like a way to really, you know, research and, 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 and to be drawn and, and to want to know um, a figure of love. It's a cor there's a corporality to it as well, like the veins of the city or, you know, sort of the inner, <laughs> the innards um, of the city. That's kind of how you feel when you're in the subway crushed with all those people on the film, in the film. Yeah, very certainly intimate at those points. I think what's amazing, uh, and that just came out in, in everything you said, is, you know, nominally this is a very autobiographical film, but it opens up a, a space of experience which is not at all autobiographical. And, and if anything, it's remarkable how unobtrusive she is as a writer of autobiography in this film. Wouldn't you agree? Th th this is the remarkable thing. I mean, those of you who have been coming to see Ackerman's films who, who have caught the bug will all know this. And you'll certainly, you can certainly register it um, in terms of those of us who have been writing about her work, it's, um, her films are uncanny in this, in this way of being extraordinarily personal and yet resonating deeply. Um, so they, I mean, they don't, I wouldn't use, I wouldn't dare to use the notion of the universal. And I don't think she's that interested in the universal per no. se, but she, uh, she grabs you as a uh, through her image and through her use of sound and through the dissonances and through the uh, contrasts and also the demand. When you you know when you cede to the demand, you, you know it's as if you're 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 drawn in in a very intimate relationship. Um, so I don't know other I don't know of any other filmmaker that does that at least for me. And I don't I, again I wouldn't say it's universal at all. There's plenty of people who can't bear to watch a San Chantal Ackerman film. Um, and we yeah, can understand can. that too. Yes, please. I Go just ahead. wanted to say that I wasn't so fascinated from the city when I saw the movie now. So this was not my point. I was fascinated by the movie, how it That's was fine. shot, how it was made. Yes, you know, so I wasn't drawn too much into this New York yeah. stuff. But I also, for me, I raised the question, okay, which city would I like to film the way Chantal Ackermann did? Yeah, you know, That's a good question. For me, it was like, yeah. uh, I would go to Tehran or something like yeah. this. Because, and so this was for me the question, it was more the question, what are the fascinating aspects for me then, yeah, which would me draw into a city to do a movie about the city. I mean, the things in cities are all, nearly all, everywhere the same, more or less. Mm. I mean, you got shops, you got people, you got people hanging outside, you got restaurants, you got every kind of, of things there. Yeah? It's quite similar on, in different places, yeah. And so I was, for me, the question was, you know, why, where, where, which, which are the things that make a city fascinating for me? Where I, yeah, hang up my, my desire or whatever it is, yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, somehow I think it's not, it's, this is not a travelogue, right? And it's not a city that simply fascinates her. It's a city, it's an alternative home that she 
finds in New York, and and there, the, I think, hence the the type of intimacy that we have with it from an outsider. Um, so it would have to be a city that you have a deep relationship with, but is not the city of your origin. And I think there's something that there's something you know a, a really. Watching a really simple idea executed well always inspires others to think of how they can do it. And I think, uh, why not? Or yeah. do the YouTube uh, parallels uh, today? Or I mean, there's yeah. I think I think the sign for me of of a really interesting film is is when it inspires others to think about how they, you know, their own creative relationship to it. Just in, in parentheses, a lot of the films, Hollywood films, supposedly set in New York that were shot in the 90s or produced in the 90s were actually short, shot in Toronto um, because, you know, there were some streets that looked similar and you could employ non-unionized personnel and save a lot of money. So um, the, the New York of movies is not always no. the New York of movies. And apparently the, uh, the, the main expense, aside from film stock for this film, was getting uh, insurance in order to be get be able to get the permit to shoot in the subway. Right. <laughs> That's where all the money went. Um, yes. Let me just remind you, you that this is a German television movie. Uh, I imagine today. It's uh, German television used to be really cool. Uh, I, w I mean, I don't know anything about its broadcast history here, and I don't think it premiered on German television, but I would like to know. Actually, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I'm, I'm guessing it's a so-called Kleines Fernsehspiel. So it was produced by the Zweite Deutsches Fernsehen for a experimental window that they had on Thursday night. And basically they were freed from any pressure. Um, and uh, the... We need that back. Yeah, we need that back because, you know, they. that's where Jim Jarmusch made, like, uh, Stranger in Paradise is it, a Kleines Fernsehspiel. Yeah. Um, most of Werner Schröter's films in the 70s were made with that money. And and that was really in the, sort of an experimental window. Did they do a series on, on cities? Because that it's, was It's quite possible, but I, well, I would it's worth have to looking. look it I, did, I didn't get that far yeah. in my research, sorry. But but that was really a, a moment when, when uh, German television was sort of a research and development section and the story I mean typically this is how it went they sent their editors out to festivals and looked for um, interesting first films and then they produced the second films like Charles Burnett for instance oh yeah um, uh, the second film was uh, also a Kleines Fernsehspiel so a lot of canonical art house films from the 70s are actually German television movies interesting this was uh, something like her 10th film Actually, Here, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, absolutely. But but um, you, the I was referring to what you said that the she was hired on the basis of someone having seen Dilmon. Jean Dilmon and Dilman it can. Yeah, so that that will be the typical production history here. Yes, we uh, we've been thinking about doing a a project about this uh, entitled Real Quality TV. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If there are no more questions, Elisa, thank you so much again for My that pleasure. wonderful introduction, which in itself was a work of art. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all for coming.